again, microphone muted. We hope you guys are excited as we are to listen to Sarah Hall, the SCPS 2020 Teacher of the Year, teach us about social emotional learning in the classroom. We'll get started in about two minutes. <laughs> All right, guys, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Make sure you sign in in the link sent in the chat while you're here logged into the webinar so we can send you your recording and your certificate and enter you for a drawing at the end of this workshop. So Sarah Hall is our presenter for today, and I'm going to let her take over and explain what she will be talking to you guys about. All right, let's see if that works now. If you can hear me, give me a yes or a, a yep over in the chat box. Let me know if you can hear me now. Oh, there we go. Yay. Hey, everybody. Oh, my goodness. That made me so happy just to see that we are officially connected now. Welcome. I am so excited to connect with you all again today. Um, two days ago, we talked about being a first-year teacher, and um, I just enjoyed every single moment of it, so I'm so excited to connect with you again today. I'm going to introduce myself so you know that... Um, uh, where I'm coming from, where this this mindset is coming from, where my information is coming from, and if we already know each other, hello, and if we don't, we're going to become fast friends, but I want to share with you who I am. So like Katie said, thank you for that introduction, Katie. My name is Sarah Hall, and I am the 2020 Seminole County Public Schools District Teacher of the Year. Um, I am currently teaching in a first grade classroom here in Seminole County. I am in my 17th year of teaching. I have my undergraduate degree from USF in elementary education. So I'm certified kindergarten through sixth grade. I also um, have my master's in reading education from UCF. So I'm certified in reading kindergarten through 12th grade. I have my ESOL endorsement. And then I'm also an adjunct professor here at UCF. So that's how I know so many of you gorgeous future teachers that I'm so happy and proud to to know. Um, I also have been recognized for excellence in education by the Florida Department of, Ed of Education, by the United States Congress, Senator Marco Rubio, Senator Rick Scott, and Disney World. So um, I am very excited to be here with all of you today and to share my expertise and what I have learned um, through all these 17 years of being in the classroom with all of you, I have taught kindergarten, first, second, and fourth grades, uh, but I have worked extensively through third and fifth grade as well, just not as a full-time classroom teacher. So that is who I am as far as my education background, and I am just so excited to be here with you all. I have been totally immersed all day today in figuring out and navigating this new shift of teaching for first grade with this e-learning. And so this is kind of a, a brain respite for me this afternoon just to talk about something that I love so much that I'm so passionate about and connect with you lovely people and just end my day on such a high note. So I am so thrilled that you have chosen to join me. We are going to talk today about social emotional learning in the elementary classroom. So I'm going to share these slides with you with a lot of content. I'm going to share some pictures of things I use in my classroom. Like Katie said, this is an almost three hour professional development that I offer to classroom teachers. Teachers. I have condensed it down into about one hour for us. And also, like Katie said at the end, we are going to have a Q&A session. So make sure you have something to write with, something to write on, jot down some questions as we go. And then at the end, I'll make sure to circle back to those. Um, if you are excited and ready to get started in this content with me, give me a whoop whoop over in the chat box and let me see who is ready. There we go, Alex coming in first. Hey, sweet Alex, up. Oh, awesome, I see so many sweet friends. Hey, Michelle, awesome. All right, so let's do this. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. There's Kristen, all right, here we go. 
So when we talk about, oops, I think I'm gonna have to close out the chat so that I can move through my slides. Let's see, you all are ready to go and I'm ready to go, but I'm trying to get to the next slide here. Um, let's see, I have it on share. Katie, if you have anything to offer as far as help here, I'm on share and I'm trying to click through the PowerPoint. Um, let's see. Double click. There we go. Katie, once again, coming through, receiving the gold star. Kiss your brain. I love it. Great job. All right. So here we are. There's me. I know you can't see me in the video, but I promise I'm here. That is me. Um, and here we go. Oops, and now I'm double clicking too much. There we go. All right, so we're gonna get started with what is social emotional learning? SEL or social emotional learning is probably a buzzword that you have started hearing a lot about. So we're gonna really dig deep into what this actually is, what does it mean, what are the implications for you as an educator, and also what are the implications for what this looks like in your classroom? Because it's kind of, one of those ambiguous things if you don't really have the exact examples of what it looks like in your classroom it's just kind of this buzzword and this idea or this um, topic that that maybe doesn't seem as concrete so we're going to firm things up give you a good foundation of what this looks like and like i said before give you some good examples of pictures of my classroom so what is social and emotional learning? It's the process where children and adults, but we're talking about children here for the sake of um, keeping this relevant to our classrooms, uh, develop essential social and emotional skills, knowledge, attitudes, and values. So there are five different components within SEL. We have self-awareness, we have responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness, and self-management. If you um, feel like you're trying to take notes, don't stress if you don't get everything written down because also like Katie said, you're gonna get a copy of my PowerPoint. So uh, don't feel like you have to get everything dotted down. So within these different components of social emotional learning, what we're really doing here is we're equipping our students students to be able to manage themselves as far as their social and emotional connections with themselves and the world around them and then connect that to learning. We want our students to really be able to acquire new information but make connections to it to their mental health in a really healthy and positive way. So let's keep going. We're going to dig further into this. What emotions are we talking about here? Which emotions require social emotional learning? Self-management. So I want students to be able to, here's another buzzword for you, self-regulate. I want my students to self-regulate and self-manage their own behaviors and emotions because if I'm not always there to help them with that and to scaffold that support for what they need to be able to manage, then I'm not reaching my ultimate goal as an educator of equipping them so they can do it when I'm not there. I know that as a teacher, if I can teach my students in a way so that when I walk away, they're still successful, then I've done my job. So I want my students to feel equipped to do this on their own as well. There's also that component of self-awareness. So being aware of how you feel and then being able to name that is really important, especially think of our youngest learners here. So when our kindergarten and first grade students come in and they say things like, my tummy hurts. Well, when you're five or six and you don't have the awareness to name that emotion you're feeling, a tummy ache could be that you have to go to the bathroom. It could be that you're hungry, you ate too much breakfast, you're worried about something, you miss your caregiver. So really being able to equip them with naming how they feel and then being aware of that is gonna be an important step. Also social awareness is key here. So if we can have students also know how they connect with the world around them, then they're gonna be able 
to make positive relationships. Think back to when you were in elementary school or maybe even people that you know now. Do you know anybody that is what we would call a close talker? Every time you go to talk to them, you feel like they're just a little, a little too close to your face. Or you have somebody that can't quite read those social cues. You're checking your watch, you're checking your phone, you're saying you have to get going, you're even starting to turn your body like you've got to walk away, you're giving every social cue, but they're just not picking up on it. That's that social awareness. So we want students to also be able to understand an awareness of the world around them. And that's a little bit more challenging for our kids, especially because they're so egocentric in that when they're that little, their world and their perspective and their life is all that they know. Um, I always associate this back to when I was in college and I was a live-in nanny. So I lived in a mother-in-law suite out in back of a house and I was their live-in nanny. And the only places that one of the little boys knew of that, that they had been when the mom took them to go run errands, they would always either go to Publix or Target. That was that was pretty much it. So I remember every time I would bring in a new little toy or, or treat or just something for us to do, he would always say, Miss Sarah, where did you get this? Publix or Target? And in his eyes and his world and with his perspective, those were the only two stores that existed. Those were the only places he had been. So in his mind, obviously, every single thing either came from Publix or Target. So getting them to, again, have that awareness that the world is bigger than, than just them. Also relationship skills, being able for students to have appropriate relationships and make those good choices. So if you remember in your reading classes, or if you haven't gotten to this point yet, in reading, we always talk about think alouds how it's important for students to tap into your metacognition. So let's talk about that, break that down for a second. Metacognition is, at its easiest definition, it's thinking about your thinking, okay? So if I want to do a read aloud and a think aloud with a book, so my students are hearing me thinking about my thinking so that they can replicate that when they're reading, the same thing is true for teaching them about relationships. So applying that same concept of a think aloud and saying things like, you know what, I'm noticing that when you're with this particular friend, the two of you seem to make the same poor choices. And I know that if I have a friend and every time I spend time with that one friend, I feel like I'm making poor choices, then I need to think, is this a good friend for me to have? So having that ability to kind of talk them through what that sounds like, what that thought process is, what that feels like is gonna be important. And then a responsible decision-making. All right, that one's way more self-explanatory. Let's keep going. So why is social emotional learning important for children? So many reasons. It helps them be able to manage themselves. It also helps them to be able to understand perspectives of others. They're able to make better choices about personal and social decisions. These social emotional skills are really important for the short term outcome that social emotional programs promote. And we're, we're going to dig into these deeper. So stay with me. But it also creates more pos positive attitudes towards oneself and others. They're having a better self-confidence, a better self-awareness. They're able to relate to their friends better. They make more positive social behaviors, have more positive relationships, not only with their peers, but also adults. They have reduced conduct problems, less risk-taking behaviors, decreased emotional distress, and improved test scores, grades, and attendance. So, I mean, even if we only took three of these, it would be well worth it to incorporate in our classroom. But there's a multitude of reasons why this is well worth um, our time to implement this into our classroom. In the long run, greater social and emotional competence can increase the likelihood of high school graduation, readiness for post-secondary education, career success, positive family and work relationships, better mental health, reduced criminal behavior, and engaged citizenship. 
And wow, aren't those things that we want for all of our students, right? If a child doesn't know how to read, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to swim, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to multiply, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to drive, we teach. If a child doesn't know how to behave, we teach, punish. Why is it harder to finish that last sentence? Because there isn't a direct curriculum for how to teach students how to behave. And there has been a huge shift in the accountability between home and school in the last couple decades for us to be able to really look at how are students learning how to behave? Does it happen at home? Does it happen at school? Is it a combination? But really taking the approach of, we need to teach students this. Is it not a skill just like reading, swimming, multiplying? And then look at this image, I love this. Everyone's growth looks different. I also saw on Twitter lately, and Alex and my friends that are in my class right now are gonna giggle because they know I always talk about getting on Twitter. But if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter, connect with me on there and I'll share how to connect with me at the end. But um, I also saw, saw something recently on Twitter that said, if you put popcorn kernels in the bottom of a pan with heated oil, Every single one of those kernels is in oil, the exact same temperature. But do, does every single kernel pop at the exact same time? No, it looks different for everyone. So everyone's growth looks different. And just like the implication of this picture shows, sometimes you can't see it. It's what's happening below the surface and we can't quite see that growth yet. I love to tie in books to what I do because I have such a passion for um, children's literature, but a great book to tie in your classroom along to this concept is Leo the Late Bloomer. So that's another one to keep in mind. Let's keep going. So how do we teach it? What does that even look like? We cultivate kindness. So let's look at some words that um, go along with cultivating kindness here. Connect, wow, it's so powerful to connect with your students and also connect with their families. Understand, to me, this means being a trauma-informed educator. If you don't know what trauma-informed educator means, if that's new to you, then I would love to have another conversation with you all at some point about that. Google it, look into it, research it, but wow, it's really important. Also listening, students will talk to us if we give them up opportunity to share. Something that I like doing in my classroom is kind of like how we did our mental health check-in at the beginning and um, in just kind of a tongue-in-cheek funny way, I asked you all to connect your emotions with a candy because if you know me, you know I'm always thinking about food, so we're connecting it to, to food here, but if we are able to connect with students and just let them share, then it's really powerful. Something that I do is every couple of weeks, I sit down with my students one at a time, and I set the, uh, the alarm on my phone and I say, all right, I'm setting my alarm for three minutes. You don't have to say anything if you don't want to, but for three minutes, you can tell me anything you want to tell me. And I just hit go and I let them share. And sometimes they just kind of look at me and smile and say, I don't really know what to say. And I say, that's okay. If you want to stop, you can go back to your seat. And sometimes they do. Sometimes they talk for the whole three minutes. And if I can tell they need to keep going, I pause the alarm and I just let them keep going. But you'd be surprised at how much they want to share if you just give them that space. Taking time to, to get to know your students, inspire them, but be approachable. Um, we don't want to give the, the false image of having all the answers and being perfect. I am the first to say that as an educator, I shared with you my accolades and my awards and I'm so, so proud of them. They mean so much to me, but I'm also the first person to say, I do not have all the answers and I do not do it perfectly every day. There is not a day goes, that goes by that I say, oh, I just, I did everything perfectly today. It doesn't happen. So being able to inspire them, but also be approachable and relatable, value, accept, teach, empathize is a huge one. This is what's really going to help you create that culture of kindness in your classroom. I like to it, um, uh, incorporate a lot of images and, and quotes into what I do, because oftentimes I feel like th there's other people that have already said this so, more, so much more eloquently than I ever could. But here, Peggy O'Mara, I love this. The way we talk to our children 
becomes their inner voice. That is so powerful to me. Students start hearing and saying to themselves what they've already heard others say about them. So if we can build them up and teach them that growth mindset and that positive self-talk, that's going to be so empowering for them. So this is a picture of inside my classroom. Um, this is a way that I also teach my students how to connect with each other in a positive way and build positive relationships and also learn about the perspective outside of themselves. So when a student in my class needs to apologize, these are the steps they take. Now, I have two brothers and when I think back to when I was a kid, if I did something I should have done and my mom said, Sarah, go apologize to your brothers, I would usually say, I'm sorry. And I never, I never, don't tell them but I never really meant it. <laughs> and I just kind of went back to what I was doing. Is, is that really a, an apology? I feel like an apology is more of a two-way dialogue. I need to be able to be respectful enough to the person I hurt to allow them an opportunity to respond to my apology. It's not me just saying, I'm sorry, moving on. So this, these are the steps that my students take. They say, I am sorry for, what are, the, what are you sorry for? It's wrong because, so they are acknowledging that it is wrong and why, why was that wrong to do? Next time I will, and is there anything I can do? And then being able to teach them that, yes, hopefully right at that moment, you've been able to go back to being friends and positive classmates, but sometimes it takes a little time. Just because you say you're sorry doesn't mean that the problem goes away right away, right? So walking them through some of these narratives can be really helpful. I also have in my classroom, and this is another conversation for another time, but I have gotten away with my behavior charts. I do not have a quote unquote time out area, um, but I do have uh, the implementation of a program called Conscious Discipline. It is by an Orlando based woman named Becky Bailey, Dr. Becky Bailey. And you heard me say her name when I was sharing two days ago with you all about first year teaching, but this is my um, safe space is what it is called. So I have a lot of resources here where students can go if they ask to have um, uh, some time in the safe space. If they know that they need a break and they need to go and self-regulate, then they're able to come over here and use the different materials that I have. So on the left, um, this, is, this is a list of the options that they have while they're in the safe space. So it says, I need to get calm, get a comfy seat. There's research behind why it's a beanbag. It envelops them and it's that um, little bit of pressure of feeling uh, enveloped by something and it's a calming technique also they can pick a calm down tool I have stuffed animals I have a little wipey box of fuzzy pom-poms that they pull out and count I have a book full of family pictures that they brought in the first day of school, sensory bottles. I have some lotion called calm down cream. They know they're allowed to have one pump of that and that hand-to-hand um, that -hand touch and um, rubbing in the lotion is also a calming uh, technique. They set a child-friendly timer for how long they need to be in there. And then when they're ready, they come and get back to work. There's also an emotion chart so they can use that to tell me how they feel. And then I'm going to move on to that. There's also on the right hand picture up at the top right corner, you can kind of see there's also a chart that says better choices. And here's a better picture of that here. So they can walk through some better choices. If I've asked them to go to the safe space and um, self-regulate and use some of those tools to be able to calm down, then this is a, an opportunity for them to relate to some pictures and decide how they want to make better choices moving forward. And again, you're going to get at this PowerPoint, so you'll have all these resources. And oh, I love this. This is from my friend, Brian Mendler. I don't really know him, but I call him my friend because I love him so much. He's not giving me a hard time. He's having a hard time. Change that entire perspective for us as an educator and think, this student is probably dealing with way more than I am having to deal with in this moment. I'm an adult. I know how to process my emotions in a healthy way and self-regulate and self-manage those things. And here's a five, six, seven, maybe even a 10-year-old child. It is a lot harder for them to learn this than for us to just do it um, subconsciously as an adult. So when students are acting out they're not giving us a hard time. They're having a hard time. And that allows you to completely replenish your patience because you're taking a new 
perspective on what is happening in that moment. And that has always been very powerful for me. Here are some books to teach social emotional learning. I shared a lot more of them the other day, um, but here are just a few. I shared about Leo the Late Bloomer. That is a great book that is all about the different growth paths that children take. So some students read earlier than others, write earlier than others, and also develop the ability to self um, regulate behaviors earlier than others, but it's a great story for that. Um, hopefully you remember where the wild things are for when you were a child. This is a great classic, but again, what it looks like to kind of have a temper tantrum and this lends itself to some great conversations of how Max could have better handled his behaviors and his emotions. When Sophie gets angry, really, really angry. And then also sometimes on Bombaloo are both two stories that talk about anger and, and what to do in that situation. So um, two more really, really great ones for that. And there's so many more great resources out there. Um, maybe I can get, uh, Katie, we can also share the list that I shared uh, two days ago of lots of more titles that I use for social emotional learning in my classroom. But anytime you can connect it to a story, it's so much more engaging for students. So let's talk now about top three to include me. So we want every student to feel included in our classroom. We want every student to feel like they have a special place in our classroom. And so there's three top steps that I think are very important for inclusion as far as behavior and social emotional learning. And the first is rapport. Designate time to build relationships. Get to know your students. Get to know their families. But once students see that you care, they're going to be way more willing to share. So get to know them, invest in them, and then I promise you they will meet you halfway. It's critical to establish trust before placing demands. This one is huge. If I walked in my classroom and I just started barking out demands of what I wanted my students to do, I would not have the engagement or the success that I'm looking for. But if I can establish trust first, then I am going to get way more, and I want to say compliance here, but it's not even really compliance because, again, those students are going to be meeting you halfway. They're going to be investing in you and your classroom just like you are with them. So build that trust first and take time now to build trust so that there's that long-term student success. If you think, oh, all my students are doing great, well, that's fantastic, but it might not always stay that way. So continue to invest in them so that when those hard conversations come up, you'll be ready and you'll have that rapport with them. How to build rapport. Oh, this is my little munchkin, one of the, one of the little first grade babies in my class this year and seeing his face right now is just making me so happy. So this is a picture of a student that is in my class this year and you can see um, how happy he was. One morning he came in and he said, Miss Hall, I have something for you. I know how much you love playing Pokemon. Okay, now I have to stop the story for a second to tell you. You guys, I know nothing about Pokemon. I've never played Pokemon in my life. I don't know who any of the characters are. I don't even really know what it is. I know there's an app with Pokemon Go. What is it? I don't know. Does anybody really know? It's the answer the world may never be able to figure out. I don't know anything about Pokemon. But for some reason, he thought I loved it. And that reason is because he loves Pokemon. And so anytime he wants to talk to me about Pokemon, now obviously not in the middle of our math lesson, right? But anytime I'm connecting with them and he wants to share about Pokemon, I act like it is the most interesting thing I have ever heard. And so this little um, cupcake came in my room and and said, Miss Hall, I know how much you love playing Pokemon. And so last night, I made you your very own set of Pokemon cards so you can take them home and play Pokemon tonight. And you better believe I acted like he had handed me a million dollars. So get to know your students, like what they like, love what they love. They're going to see that. And that's how you're going to connect with them. Build that rapport into your daily routine. Show a genuine interest in them and what they like. Let them see you make mistakes and own them. That is powerful too. And also ask them questions. Be their biggest fan. See that picture just made me so happy. Let's keep going. 
daily greeting. So I have a chart at my front door where when students come in my classroom every morning, I greet them and they have a choice of how to greet me back. So this example on the left says PE, but I have one that looks very, very similar to it, but I wanted to give you an example. Students have their choice of how they wanna greet me every morning. They can give me a high five, a hug, a smile, wave, handshake, fist bump. But um, I've seen ones that also incorporated dance and an elbow high five, but anything you can do, even if it's just five seconds a student, but to make that eye to eye contact, welcome them to the day and say, I'm glad you're here. Those five seconds per student, I promise you, will change your classroom. Here's the second one, self-regulation strategies. Let's look at the quote first. When little people are overwhelmed by big emotions, it's our job to share our calm, not join their chaos. How true is that? I say this too to people. I say, please don't let your emergency become my emergency. And not that we don't wanna be there for our friends and family, but being able to, in those tough moments say, your chaos is not going to become my chaos. My calm is going to become your calm. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. It could be sitting down and just connecting with them with a story. It could be holding their hand in line in the hall, inviting them to have lunch with you in the classroom. But that is a powerful perspective. Self-regulation means students are identifying their emotions and also they're equipping themselves with coping skills. So when they have their moments when they feel out of control, whether it's with anxiety, anger, whatever it is, they're able to equip themselves with how they could cope in a healthy way. That's the key here. Some strategies are teaching and practicing self-regulation while being calm. You don't ever want to instruct a child on how to be calm when they are in chaos. When they're in that chaotic mode, that's not the time to teach calming techniques. You teach it when they're calm so that they can do it when they're not. Um, also, we help them be able to use them more effectively and independently during moments of escalation. So we're practicing those calming techniques when they're calm, and then when they're escalated, they know what to do. Once they get to that escalation point, you cannot introduce any calming techniques in that moment resources, feelings, check-in. So we did this at the beginning of our session through food because I love candy and I wanted to incorporate candy into our session because I was sitting here looking at some Twizzlers I'm saving for watching a movie later tonight and I was excited about some candy. But here we can incorporate a feeling check-in with our students. This is one example of a, a little chart where students are able to um, connect with you and how they feel. I've seen this done in so many ways. I was not the teacher I was before Pinterest. I love going on Pinterest and getting ideas, um, but there's a wealth of, of ideas on there as well that you could find, but just one example here. And then remember, relationships matter. This is going back a little bit to our being a trauma-informed teacher, but let's look at this quote together. Trauma-informed leadership is about recognizing that fear and oppression is constantly trying to find new form. With every decision you make about a student, ask yourself this, what bit of their story is being reenacted at school? So let's break that apart for a second. Think of some of these horrific stories that we hear about on the news or that we hear about at, at school-based sites of just awful, horrible things that students go through. And then think, how does that transfer from their home to school? There is a strong correlation between their school day and their home life. So if they are in that escalated mode at home and they're living in chaos, then they don't clock out of that at 8 a.m. and clock back into it at 3.15 when they get off the bus or back in the car or walk home or whatever. They're not clocking in and out of that. That carries with them all day, just like it does for us. If I'm going through something in my personal life, I try to clock out of it at 8 a.m. and wait and clock back into it at the end of the school day. I try to be present with my kids, but we're all human. 
And we're better at being able to manage that clock in, clock out technique because we're adults and we've been doing this a lot longer. But when you're five, six, seven, 10 years old, that is so much more of a challenge. They don't understand how to process all of that yet. So if they're acting out at school, acting out that chaos, that's because there's that correlation between what's happening at home, the potential for it, not all the time, but there's that strong potential there. So those relationships matter so that we can help them be successful while they're with us. I can't control what happens at their home, but I can help them when they're with me. You can't teach children to behave better by making them feel worse. When children feel better, they behave better by allowing students to have the dignity of going through and working through a behavior issue with somebody that is saying to them, you're not less because of this. We're gonna get through this together. I'm here for you. Imagine even you at, at, at this stage in your life as an adult, if you were going through something and you were feeling bad, if somebody made you feel worse for that, then you're not going to be able to be pulled out of that, even if you're pulling yourself out. But imagine somebody coming up to you and saying, you're not less. I'm here for you. We're going to get through this together. It's going to get better. And I'm going to hold your hand while we get to that place. That is so powerful. Students need that too. So my friend again that I've never met, but I call him my friend because I just love him so much, Brian Mendler, on the left here, he said, please, and I shared this the other day, please get the behavior or chip, uh, a clip stoplight charts off the wall. My behavior is not a decoration for your classroom. Humiliation and embarrassment are not valid classroom management or behavior strategies. How true is that? He also said, if you have a behavior chart hanging in your classroom, you have given up your right to tell the rest of your students to mind their own business. And that is so true. In order to set up a culture in your classroom for self-regulation, discipline with dignity, allowing students to feel equipped and empowered to self-regulate, then we need to get those behavior charts off the wall. I got rid of mine a couple years ago and I'm never looking back. I'm telling you, even in first and um, kindergarten, you don't have to have a time out area. I'm telling you, I'm in the trenches, so to speak, every day with you teaching. You don't need it. He wrote this book called Discipline with Dignity, and I would encourage everybody to read it. And once you do, reach out to me. I'm going to share with you at the end how, but I'd love to connect with you about it. And then also there's the trend and the understanding of the belief that there's Maslow before Bloom. In teaching, you can't do the Bloom stuff until you take care of the Maslow stuff. So let's break this down together. We know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So that means feeling safe, having food and water, feeling happy and comfortable and ready to learn, ready for your day. That is always going to trump Bloom's taxonomy, that hierarchy of learning. So if students come to school happy, and excited to learn, they feel safe, they've had breakfast, they're not worried about where they're gonna get their next meal, they're not worried about the chaos that they might go home to, but if they can be happy when they're with you and feel ready to learn and excited about learning, then they're going to be ready to learn academics too. But if they come to you and they're hungry or scared, they feel unsafe, they feel that chaos, then they are not going to care at all about the lesson that you've prepped for them. Not at all. So if you can get them to feel happy and safe and excited about learning, then, then you've got them right where you want them to be able to go through some, some um, new language acquisition, new learning acquisition, and all of that. Here's another one from Brian Miller I love. You, and this is, for, this is for us. This is for us teachers. This is what we need to remember, the mindset we need to have, because there's going to be kiddos that the investment is hard. The investment is tough. But listen to what Brian tells us. You can be hungry. I'm sorry. You can be angry. You can be annoyed. You can be frustrated. You can occasionally lose your mind. You can even take breaks. You cannot quit on them ever. Students need to know that you are not going to quit on them. And sometimes it's the students that are having the toughest time self-managing their behavior and self-regulating their behavior. Those are the ones that have had the most people in their life quit on them. 
So by you showing up every day and saying, I'm not going to quit on you. Sometimes I get angry. Sometimes I get annoyed. Sometimes it's frustrating. Sometimes I need to take a break, but I'm not going to quit on them. All right. We are at the Q and A part. I know that we need to wrap up um, in about five to seven minutes so Katie can share some resources and do some giveaways. So I am going to, at this point, stop, share, and I am going to go to, um, let's see, if you are able, Katie, to help me unmute everybody, then we are going to come back together for a Q&A session, and I would love to hear anything that you're wondering, and then I'm going to also um, give you an opportunity to um, connect with me on social media if we're not yet, but that is, again, that is part of a three-hour um, professional development that I offer to teachers, and I took out a lot of slides and a lot of content to be able to do this in one hour, but I wanted to provide an a, um, in-depth enough overview so that you were had a familiarization with, with this topic. But if you would like to share out, unmute yourself, ask a question, ask something in the group chat. Does anybody have a question about social emotional learning or even a comment, a connection? Alex, go ahead, sweetie. Yeah, so how, I know you said that you took down your behavior chart a few years back. Um, how was that transition for you from, you know, using that behavior chart um, and then just stopping, kind of like cold turkey, just stopping um, and then doing the social emotional learning with your classroom that year? I love that question. Thank you, Alex. So, you know, it was, it was definitely a transition. Um, and it was, but I'll be honest, it was way more of a transition for me than it was for them. Yeah. I had been stuck in that mindset for so long that their transition and that shift was so much harder for me than for them. Yeah. And so once I was able to wrap my mind around what this new way of, of thinking and approaching behavior was, and then also being able to figure out kind of the kinks myself, then we just kind of took off with it. So I'll, I'll share this. I started this transition at the end of a school year a couple years ago because I already knew my students. I had built that rapport. Um, I knew what my kids needed. And so I knew that even if there was this kind of funky transition period where I needed to figure this out, how exactly this was going to work, that it wasn't gonna make them crumble, right? I still, I still had them where I needed them. I had equipped them with what um, they needed to know, like my expectations of the classroom and everything. So I did it at the end of the school year, just because A, I had built that rapport, and those relationships with my kids. And then I was able to figure out the kinks and get used to it before I implemented it the first day of school the following year. So after that year, my subsequent students have never known anything different. Um, from me in my classroom, but it was way more of a shift for me than it was for them. That was a great question. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah. Or I see Claudia. Hi, hi, Claudia. Hi. Um, so I just have one quick question. Everything you said um, has been perfect. I love all of it so far. Um, I just have <laughs> some things that you said um, when you were saying that you should wait until the kid is done and then they're calm. And everything is better. What are some good techniques that you have used inside your classroom to help calm down a student? I love that. Thanks for the question, sweet Claudia. So some things that I use are breathing techniques. Um, there's a lot within conscious discipline. So she shares how to teach students to breathe like a pretzel. So um, they put their hands together and kind of twist their arms a little bit and take deep breaths. Um, there's also in my um, as one of the resources over in my safe space, I have pinwheels. And so breathing on the pinwheels, it doesn't create any noise, but it, um, you know, invites them to take those deep, deep breaths that are going to calm them down. Um, but you know, it's, it's about being able to show them how to use the, this is the big takeaway here. I teach them about all these tools, the sensory bottles, the breathing techniques, all of it. I teach it to them when they're calm. And then that way, when they're escalated, they already know 
how to use those materials over there. They already know what's expected of them. Now, let's get real because you know I'm gonna keep it real with you guys. Are there ever students who I ask them to go to the safe space and they say no and throw a fit? Yes, because guess what? They're six. Is there ever a time when I ask them to go over to the safe space and they start throwing the pom-poms that are over there? Sure, because guess what? Say it with me, ready? They're six right? Is there ever a time that they ask to go to the safe space? Not because they actually need to calm down, but because they just want to play with the stuffed animals that are over there and they don't want to do their math for five minutes. Say it with me. Yes, because they're six, right? And that's fine. If I lose six minutes of instructional time because they're six years old and they want to play with a stuffed animal, but it alleviates a trauma later in the day or a situation later in the day that could possibly escalate to me losing 30 minutes some instructional time, then go for it. Also, yeah, you're going to have those kids that aren't able to handle going over the safe space and they're escalated past the point of wanting a pinwheel, right? So then that's when you have resources on your campus and you use your teacher discernment to be able to know when to bring other people into the picture, right? To be able to, to help them because really it's about keeping everybody safe. If I feel like they're being unsafe, maybe potentially the other students in my classroom are unsafe because of their behaviors, then 100% I'm going to get somebody else in involved. But in, in the perfect world, which we know doesn't exist, right? But in the perfect world, then these are calming techniques that I've shown them when they're calm and then they use um, when they when they need to calm down. I hope that helped. Any um, other I have an addition to the question, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, has, have you noticed a difference between the boys and the girls? And if so, are there any different techniques that you use behind like their behaviors? That's a great question too. And I've never seen any kind of a trend there. Um, you know, I see more of a trend of my students who I can tell that they, um, for whatever reason and for every reason I'm able to tell that they're kind of living in a chaotic situation at home, I can tell that it's a little bit harder for them to um, adapt these modifications to how I want them to behave at school. That's more of a trend and not any kind of a trend as far as um, any other demographic in my classroom. But that was a great question. Anybody else have anything they want to ask or comments, connections, aha moments? Bianca actually asked the question in the chat. Let's um, see. What, since there's no behavior chart, what behavior management tips do you have? So, um, and then I saw Kristen had a question, so I'm gonna come to you, baby, in just a second. So um, there's a lot of different things you can use. And um, I, I use a behavior plan that my whole school uses with, it's called Promise Bands. Every morning they get three bands, they can earn more or lose them throughout the day. And, um, you know, I don't want to go too far into that just for the sake of time, but there's other things that you can do for positive reinforcement. Um, and we know research tells us that positive reinforcement is more effective than negative reinforcement. Uh, but finding something that's going to work for you. Um, last year, I didn't have anything extra. Um, I just sent notes home as needed. Um, I made sure I was always sending those positive notes home. But um, I would say, as far as behavior management, find what works for you. Remember to discipline with dignity and um, just allow students to, to feel empowered to be able to self-regulate. That's huge for them. And then Kristen, were you kind of raising your hand a little bit earlier? Yeah, I was trying to ask earlier, how do you hold them accountable? Because in the Title I school that I was interning in, the the principal paid for every single classroom to have the clip charts. And that was really the only way that they were enforcing accountability on kids' behavior. So how do you do that without that? Because that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. Thank you, sweet Kristen. Um, you know, there is that accountability piece for sure. Um, but I also know that I can't, I, I love when my parents and my caregivers follow through at home with what's happening during the school day. But I also know that th there's a couple things here. I, I can't count on the accountability at home to really reinforce what I'm trying to do in the classroom all the time, right? Um, I also know that if I can offer my students incentives to um, really use these techniques and, and 
self-monitor and all those kinds of things, uh, if I can have some kind of incentives like, you know, treasure box or anything like that. I mean, let's remember they're five and six years old, right? So, but I never wait until fun Friday on Friday afternoon, because if they have earned it on Monday, but then maybe by Tuesday, they've made some really poor choices and maybe they haven't earned treasure box or fun Friday and it's not all the way until Friday. I want them to come in every single morning knowing that they have a shot of having a successful day. Um, the other thing with that, that I wanted to mention is that, you know, with students too, it's, it's really allowing them the opportunity to recover. So if a student has a really bad moment, um, and they're making poor choices, but then they effectively use the tools I've equipped them with and I see them self-monitor and self-regulate, then to me, that's still a successful day because we're not always going to be perfect all the time, right? So if I can also see that they use those self-regulation techniques and they're able to get back on track, then to me, that's still a success. So I think we only have a couple more, a couple more minutes here. I know Katie needs to um, do some giveaways and be able to um, share a couple more resources too. Is there one more question before I turn it over to Katie? Anybody? All right. Well, that good. That's good. That means that you got lots of lots of great information, and maybe you're still just processing it. But I'm going to share with you also how I'm going to go back to share for just a second. Katie, and I'm going to share with them how they can keep in touch with me because I want to make sure that if you think of a question that um, you'll definitely be able to um, get in touch with me. So this was so great. Please don't let this be goodbye. Please keep in touch. If we are not connected, connect with me on Twitter. I'm at Sarah Hall KG. I'm also on Instagram at at meet underscore miss underscore hall. So please connect with me. If you read Discipline with Dignity, let me know. If you use any of these techniques or think of any questions, again, please let me know. But I would love to be connected with you. So that's how you can connect with me. And I'm going to go to stop share now and kick it over to Katie. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. You are always a joy to have in these workshops. So I just sent the resource link into the chat. Uh, once again, I'm going to resend the sign-in. Make sure your name is on the sign-in sheet so we can email you resources and the webinar recording. We do have, I believe, three winners already. Let me go find them. All right, so our winners for tonight are Katia Perez. I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, even though you told me how to pronounce it. Shayna? Shayna Bumbazi and Natalia Soto. So those are our winners for tonight. Can you guys mm -hmm. hop on, tell us where you're from? Hi, this is Natalia. I'm from UCF. Yay, hi Natalia. Hi, it was great to join you again today. Thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you for joining me. I love it. <laughs> thank you for all the great resources. Of course, anytime, sweet girl. Hi, I'm Katia Perez. I'm from UCF, Florida. <laughs> hey, Hello, Katia. wow, to UCF. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Shane. I'm also from UCF. All right, UCF dominated. Yeah, look at that. Time. Awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining this. Um, for most of your questions you guys were asking, we do have two workshops that pertain to clip charts and classroom management techniques and specific strategy. Um, the clip chart one is the 28th at 8 p.m. and classroom management is the 31st at 8 p.m. So we will definitely be answering some of those questions as well. And tomorrow we have another webinar. Um, it is also at 8 p.m. I believe and it's stepping away from lecturing and into questioning and it's going to have have um, student focused classroom tools and activities. So I hope you guys are really excited for that one. We hope to see you tomorrow. And you should receive the emailed recording in a couple days. So you guys can go ahead and log off. Bye Until everybody, thanks dessert. for joining me. I had the best time, thank you.